It wouldn't be a proper season of downloadable content unless we did some free play episodes, and today we give you the first of them here in 2019. As usual, it's an open discussion where I and the panel talk about anything related to video games and the industry at large. Also, to add to the fun, I have no idea what the rest of the panel is going to be talking about, which only adds to the mystery. It's our first free play of 2019, next on Downloadable Content. Welcome to Downloadable Content. I am Brian, and with me we have Ron. Hey, everyone. We have Ronnie. I'm definitely not an animal. <laughs> and, and returning for the third time is a Spencer. Welcome back. Hello. He's the baby of the group. <laughs> I might be the oldest still, though. You might be. You might be. So, <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Spencer? I will be 36 in October. Yep, you just beat me. Yep. Yes. Congratulations. I, I yay. It <laughs> depends out. <laughs> but yes, it is our first free play episode. Open discussion. Talk about anything. So I suspect there's going to be a rant or five. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's usually how these things work. But before we dive in, just want to remind everyone out there on the wide world of the internet that every single episode of downloadable content can be found on our website, dlcpodcast.com, as well as iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. So all of the different ways to get downloadable content into your ears. Just make sure you clean up afterwards. That's all I'm saying. All right, gentlemen. So we have uh, we have the four of us today, and, and I am very curious. But to start things off, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, and that's start with me. I'm, I'm usually I usually save myself to the last to clean up after everyone, but today I've decided to make an executive decision thanks to a D4, and the D4 says I go first. Absolutely. So. My uh, my introduction for this is I'm going to be talking about PAX East, since I did not get to do a proper PAX East episode because life just dragged me all over the place. PAX East started a block of eight consecutive weekends where I had shit to do, so I had no time to do a, a proper PAX episode, so I will talk a little bit about what the uh, what I experienced at this year's PAX. And you know, this, is, this was my eighth one, eight out of ten, that they've been holding in Boston now. And this year was the second year that PAX East went to a four-day convention. And after last year where I went all four days and came back with Con Plague for the first time in my life, um, I decided, no, I'll go back down to three days. I'll just go the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Thursday can... I, I can leave Thursday. Even though that for some people, Thursday winds up being their favorite day of the convention because it is the day that it's rel a relative ghost town. Like, there's actually space on the expo floor. Because once you hit Friday, or and especially Saturday, um, if you are easily claustrophobic and have any ideas of having personal space, you, you throw that right out the window. It ain't happening. <laughs> You are constantly butting up against elbows, arms, messenger bags. 
it, it, it is a mess on the expo floor, but a very controlled chaos. And this year it was notable because a number of AAA developers were absent. Usually the one they're the ones that take up the most space on the expo floor, so no Bethesda, which usually oc occupies a giant corner. I feel like a lot of the bigger companies are taking out of Nintendo's book and are starting to do their control direct where they can have more, uh, they, they can produce better rather than doing smaller conventions or even larger conventions. And th there's some truth to that. I mean, PAX is not E3 in the sense of, I mean, E3 is a production that is put on primarily for the gaming press and the gaming media, whereas all, any PAX convention, it is for gamers that is their target audience that's they're not worried about you know big media outlets like IGN or Kotaku or, or things like that this is this is primarily for for gamers so and honestly I mean for for some companies if I've noticed that in recent years if they don't really have anything new or shiny that they want to show they're just kind of like, nah, we'll skip it this year. I mean, what has Bethesda been doing? It's been nothing but either Fallout or Elder Scrolls stuff. I'm pretty sure they're living in shame. <laughs> From the Fallout 76 mess? Yes. Yes. Very much so. <laughs> they're, they're hoping if they stay out of the headlines for long enough, people will forget that it existed. <laughs> they're like, Konami will fuck up eventually, so we just gotta be patient. <laughs> When That's Death Stranding not. comes out, everyone will be talking about that, and we won't have to worry anymore. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Ah, uh, yes, and, and, and I saw that trailer, and I was just like, oh, good, this is another game that's going to leave me dazed and confused, because it's Kojima. I was about to say, you know who made it, right? Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> why. I'm just, uh... The, the, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm gonna if I ever if I ever play that game. It's a PS4 exclusive. Um, if it ever comes out on PC and I wind up playing it, I'm gonna be waiting for some sort of reference to the La Lule Lo somewhere in there. <laughs> Death Stranding is Metal Gear Solid Zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, no Bethesda. I don't. I don't even think Blizzard had a booth there this year. And so, well, they, they they were going to have a booth, but then they laid them off. They did, and that was a joke, Brian. That was a joke from the last podcast. Hey, you know, I hey, it's joke recycling. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thematic joking. Yes, there you go. It's the, we we spent like half an hour on that subject yesterday. Yeah. Though, though, for our listening public, that may have been a week or two ago. <laughs> it may have been. Time is nebulous here on downloadable content. So, like, I think the biggest chunk of the expo floor was taken up by, uh, mic the, like Microsoft, Facebook, Oculus Rift thing. Like VR took a big chunk of the floor this year. Which, considering that they started off from this tiny little, like, section of the expo floor where not very many people wandered to, to a major focus, I'm like, has VR finally gotten away from that whole, the, the uh, like, the Dippin' Dots thing? Or is it now the future? Have we evolved past the Virtual Boy? <laughs> Maybe. Kind of. Hopefully. So, because a number of, of the major players were not at PAX this year. That opened up the floor to a ton of indie devs. This particular PAX had the most indie devs I have ever seen. To the point where I think for the first time I actually got to experience uh, FOMO after the convention was over. I genuinely felt at the end of it that because there was so much, I genuinely didn't see all that there was to see because the the absence of the AAAs were the indie devs' gain. And 
all three days that I was wandering the expo floor, I found something new and interesting to play because, you know, advertising isn't really, you know, they don't have a, indie devs typically don't have a large advertising budget to begin with. So they, they go to PAX and they're just like, people, I can talk to people about my game directly. Would you like to play my game? One dev actually shoved a controller in my hand and play. <laughs> Take, play, good. Basically, and kind of in that voice, because you can tell English was not their first language. Uh, I think they were uh, some some uh, group from you know, from the Nordic countries, and <laughs> <laughs> I, f I forget which one. Uh, but they, they, they shoved a game in my hand called Panzer Paladin, which is a major love letter to the 16-bit era. The studio is is called is Tribute Games, and uh, they 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 did they shoved a Super Nintendo controller in my hand and was like play, okay. <laughs> don't tell, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> and it looks a lot of fun. It's it, it's again it it screams nostalgia, and you know that's something that we've been noticing for years with indie devs nostalgia is big business well if the big companies aren't doing it somebody's got to somebody has to and there were a lot of games on the expo floor that i really fell in love with and i'm, I'm hoping to buy when they come out a lot of the games were in development and are approaching release some games by now um so here we are in early june this is at the end of oh, March. Oh, tri tribute games. I looked them up. They're the ones who did Flint Hook. I know. Flint Hook and Mercenary. Well, there you go. Um, there were, I got roped into doing a little bit of stuff for Sprites and Dice. <laughs> because uh, Wyatt... Did you? Wyatt managed to uh, schmooze one of the devs uh, that made the game Dead Cells. Our, our sister group. <laughs> Uh, who sometimes comes in here to poach people off the Discord? Yeah, apparently, uh, it was, they were. T he he was wanted to talk with the developer of Dead Cells, and so Wyatt was recording me playing Dead Cells. Um, I had never played this game in my life, so Wyatt was expecting me to die pretty quickly. Thirty minutes later. <laughs> I'm still playing. It's amazing how many skills uh, from other games can can go on and give you. It's almost like you learn things and have this thing called reaction time. Yeah, I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I, and it's all white. I'm like, why? Did you think I've never played a platforming game before? Are you new? <laughs> and so, you know, that that took a while. Um, the game that the game of the of the event to me, the one that stuck out the most, it's actually out now on the Epic Games Store, is called Close to the Sun. It's made by the studio Storm in a Teacup. And it evokes a lot of Bioshock vibes to me. And uh, when I had said that to the developers, every single one of them made a motion like they were chugging a shot. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I know, you've probably heard that four jillion times, but it's it's absolutely true. It, it has that feel. And the game itself, t it takes place in 1897. You're on a ship called the Helios, um, which is the creation of Nikola Tesla. And the Helios serves as this sort of headquarters for the greatest scientific minds. And it's a utopia for scientific re research, which is supposed to be, you know, independent from the state and isolated from society. And I'm thinking, rapture! <laughs> so you take the, the role of a journalist who is in search for her sister. Her sister sent her a letter uh, saying, uh, please come. Um, there's bad shit happening, but they, the, she doesn't explain, as a good sibling does, uh, doesn't actually explain what the hell's going on. Oh, how very Silent Hill of you. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> bad stuff, please come, Kay. Thanks. Kay, Kay thanks, bye. <laughs> and it's 
very pretty. And as I was playing the demo, you start getting the sense of, wait a minute, Nikola Tesla is the antagonist? What? <laughs> and it, it was a short demo, and but I really, really wanted to play it. And they said that when it comes out, it would be an... At first, it would be an Epic Games Store exclusive, and it's there now. It is absolutely there now. So I'm like, oh, maybe I'm going to have to pick that up very soon. What also impressed me was a lot of games made by indie devs that are coming out for the Switch. It's like Nintendo did a complete 180 between the Wii and the Switch. Before it was, no, 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 third parties, no, it, no, 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 we're gonna do our own thing. And now it's like, please give unto me all of your indie games and third party devs. And Maybe like, because they realized they could double the lifespan of their console with third party publishers and developers? Funny that. They just have amnesia. Every, every other console, they, like, forget what made the previous console successful, and they're like, let's try this dumb thing, and then it doesn't work, and they're like, oh, I guess we'll go back to what used to work, and then it works perfectly, and they're like, oh, let's try something new again. Over and over. The cycle of Nintendo. Yet, for some reason, they still manage to stay afloat. <laughs> Frickin' Mario. It, it might have to do with the fact that they make lots of fucking money. Yeah, yeah that. <laughs> Yeah, that. <laughs> just, j just a little. <laughs> a few dollars tucked away. Yeah. Pe people see. People seem to forget when Nintendo has some kind of bomb, such as the Wii U, that they also were still riding on not just the success of the frickin' Wii, but also the DS slash 2DS slash 3DS line. That was still making bank at the time. Oh yeah, it's, like it's it was still printing money for them. <laughs> I was going to say, I, Ninten Nintendo has enough money they could form their own frickin' bank. Like, they, they're they not in any danger. They're, they're such a unique company, because, like, look at Microsoft. Like, they, every, every time they come out and, like, have, like, a couple of bad years, it's like, is Microsoft going to get out of the game? Is Microsoft, like, you know, losing their ability to, like, be a console company? And meanwhile, Nintendo can, like, fuddle a whole console cycle away and still be, like, making millions of dollars in profits. It's absolutely insane. Yes, but the other side of that is uh, you will... You, you Nintendo, more so than any of the other gaming companies, has the sky is falling group that anytime anything negative comes out from Nintendo, it's immediately... Is Nintendo going to go out of business? <laughs> Nintendo's going to go out of business. They're going to become a third-party publisher. They're going to stop producing consoles. No, guys. We're, we are so far from that happening. If the next two consoles that they made were the Switch Virtual Boy Edition and the <laughs> Switch U, and they have like an 8-10 to 10 year period of nothing, they still still would probably have enough money to continue. Well, yeah, because they would just come out with a new Pokemon game, a new Mario game, a new Zelda game, and then they'd make, like, a bajillion dollars and be fine. Yep. Like, the Switch, the Switch was, okay, uh, we've, had, we've had some rough years, so uh, let's just make two Game of the Years. Let's make a bunch of Game of the Years. Let's make Nintendo dominate the Game of the Years and make one of the best-selling consoles. Let's just do that. Yeah, let, let, let's just. And, and they did that. Yes. Yes, they have. And just the number of games that I saw that are out on Switch now or are going to be out on Switch was, it just boggles my mind. There were two such games that stick out to me. Uh, one was a game called Lightfingers, which is a, uh, a digital board game. Um, I basically, the, the quick version is, uh, Mario Party meets Capture the Flag. Okay. You're 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 playing as a thief, and the the goal is to steal um, four bags of loot and make it back to your thief base before the guards catch you. But it's done in the style of a board game. Hmm. And it looked like a ton of fun. 
And that's out on Switch now. There's another game that I played called Yaga, which is based on the folktale of Baba Yaga. Which is out on multiple platforms. It's out on Xbox One, PlayStation, PC, and it, it is coming to Switch. At least that is what the developer had told me when I talked to him. Uh, other games that stuck out, a game called Evergate, which... Um, looks like Ori and feels like Trine, so a bit of a puzzle platformer sort of thing. Uh, there was another game that called Anew the Distant Light, which is a um, sci-fi, you know, really sci-fi looking Metroidvania, which is a genre that I have fallen in love with in recent years. And... The, uh, one of the, uh, online multiplayer games that I played is, uh, is now out called, um, Avaris, which is basically, let's take a JRPG battle and make it, um, head-to-head -head online multiplayer. So, um... I have a few more minutes, so I got to see a couple of concerts while I was at PAX East. Um, two of my favorite groups were there, the, the Videri String Quartet and VGO, Video Game Orchestra. And uh, all the concerts and a lot of the panels were streamed live on Twitch, which is something that they've done for the last few years now. Um, the Videri String Quartet, they were performing in a place called The Jam Space, and... They are usually one of the biggest draws, like to the point now where two years in a row, the jam space has filled to legal maximum capacity and they had to turn people away. It's like, we cram any more people in here, that's going to violate, we have a fire hazard. <laughs> and VGO, they did a lot of music. This was their most, I said on Facebook at the time, their most metal set ever. What did uh, what did they do? They um, they did music. A lot of Capcom games uh, were in this set because they had just recently done a little tour in Asia of Capcom music. So a lot of Castlevania, Devil May Cry, uh, the music from the new Resident Evil Two remake. Although they did sneak some classics in there, we did get the main theme from Chrono Trigger and Super Mario World in there. You know, little bones to throw the crowd. <laughs> those, those are some pretty big bones to throw. Yeah, absolutely. And I was very, very glad that I had brought earplugs with me to that set. Because it was loud. It was loud and it was great. And a few hours before that, I had seen a panel of that was just video game composers. And they got to talk about, you know, what what their creative process is. What's what's going on under the hood? Which I always just like to see, just as an artist myself. I like to, to know the, the creative process. How do you make, how do you do what you do? And the composer for the song Subhuman from Devil May Cry 5, uh, he later showed up at the VGO concert to perform that, so... Really, really cool. And what else? Oh! Esports has gotten massive. For the last couple of years, uh, PAX East has had what's called the PAX Arena, and there is where they do the League of Legends major tournaments. Um, this year, the big tournament was the Super Smash Brothers Ultimate North American Open Final. That's a that's a mouthful. Oh god. Which which was a month months long tournament by Nintendo that started with twenty five thousand people and was reduced down to the last eight, and they competed in the PAX Arena for a large cash prize. Let me see what that prize was. I think it was 250,000. 
it was it was a substantial amount of money and it was well thank you nintendo for not even saying so on your website what the amount was uh, it's like hey a tournament happened um but i think it was it was you, <laughs> i think it was, you got ex you got exposure for winning okay <laughs> we'll pay you we'll pay you in mushrooms <laughs> We, we, we'll pay you in mushrooms and Mario hats. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all you're worth. <laughs> um, uh, there is a prize pool and said um, all the winner, all the, the three members of the winning team will instead receive a quote unquote collectible item tied at $500. Oh, <laughs> then I was dead wrong. Some other the tournament final below already put on one the other listed prize, which was comp to tickets to all four days of taxis as well as their flights and hotels. I was dead wrong then. I'm confusing that with another tournament that took place that had so this is basically Spencer was pretty much on the nose. They did win exposure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for reference, um according to what I'm reading on Kotaku <laughs> the uh it, it, it was a Nintendo-run thing, so their rules were a little less strict than the normal, quote-unquote, competitive scene of Smash. Um, items were turned on, as was Smash Ball. <laughs> the event is made up of five-minute rounds instead of stocks. And the, the, the 12 finalists at the event, instead of it being one-on-one -on -one matches, they're divided up into four groups of three and compete in double elimination brackets of three-on-three -three team battles. Just goes to show you, I didn't pay attention to this tournament at all. <laughs> I was somewhere else on the expo floor, but I could tell that something was going on because every few minutes or so, you'd hear this loud roar from somewhere on the expo floor. <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't that, then you also had the, the big Magic the Gathering tournament that was going on, mm -hmm. which uh, that I did watch some of and was baffled by it because I don't play Magic. That I knew was uh, the grand prize Ethan. was a million dollars. Yeah, that was the uh, the that was their first. The uh, Magic actually rebranded their uh, Pro Tour into uh, Mythic Championships, and that was the actual first one that they did there. I yep. believe it was the yeah. first one. Yeah, that um, sounds right. Uh, I th I can't remember because they split it up now because now they do Arena like their uh their program as well as Paper. Uh, tournaments for large cash paper was, paper was draft and standard was arena yeah i just can't remember if the uh, if it was the arena or the paper uh one at pax i can't remember right now it was it was the arena one because they had giant fucking like esports booth yeah, yeah, that, yeah okay play yeah. On stage live on the floor oh yeah sure that that's that's what it was and i'm watching this on screen and i'm going all right those are cards but uh <laughs> that was Again, I don't play Magic, so overall it was uh, it was an, a great great PAX, and I was just so glad to see more indies get um, more time on the floor. It's like, oh, I could I could get used to this. I could get used to this a lot. So that is going to be uh, it's going to be it for me. So that was my little PAX roundup for this year. So. Let's break out the, the D4 again, and let's see who goes. We're going to have Ronnie. I kind of felt like that was the way it was going to go. <laughs> I just had this internal... Uh, R the RNG was speaking to me. It was. Yeah, you, you felt the existential sense of dread descending upon you from the north. Well, b well, especially since I was still do doing research, but I shall re I shall go. Yeah, I mean, bef before we started, I assigned myself one, Ron two, Ronnie three, and Spencer four. So we've had a one and a three. So, so I originally had a different topic. I, I told Brian about it yesterday, but uh, I decided to go to a more serious subject that we've we've touched on before. We we've mentioned. Similar things in previous topics when we touched on Gamergate. I'm bringing up the topic I'm going to call Gamers Behaving Badly. And this will mostly be the YouTube edition. 
I was going to say, is, 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 is there a special uh, phone number that I have to call to order Gamers Gone Bad? Or uh... <laughs> I was going to say, Gamers Being Shitheads has been th a thing since literally the arcades. So yeah. you're, you're going to have to specify this. <laughs> I'm on. going to specify. Uh, well, how about an actual politician who got a lifetime ban from EVE Online? for insider trading. He was elected in game to their highest elected office, which means he dealt with developers and he represented the community to them. And he took information he signed NDAs with and used them to give to other players to leverage. Oopsies. Now this wouldn't be a big thing if he wasn't an actual politician who is not just run for office, but also currently works as a lobbyist. Because if you can't be ethical in your having almost no power elected office, how can you be trusted to have actual power over people? Oh, this is this this is shaping up to be gold right here. <laughs> uh, his name is Brian Schnoneman, and he was a very like decades old player and he was uh very well known within the community but yeah he he had gotten he he ran for this in game like it was an actual election putting advertising like doing all the things you would do that i assume he knows from actually doing them as a politician to get elected to use that knowledge to benefit his friends. Here's what I don't understand. Right off the bat, I, I kind of call this into question. I know Eve Online to the point that, like, if you if you play that game, it might as well be a, a full time job. How are yeah. you do, playing Eve Online and, and being a politician? Yes, I had the same thought. I was like, I'm not surprised they have elections in Eve Online. They basically have their own world. But I assumed at that point, you have a way to make money off of it, and you're not going to be doing anything else. Because for those who aren't aware, EVE Online is a very, very in-depth space exploration, space-focused game. Um, there's a joke in the video game community about EVE Online being the Excel spreadsheet game. And in some cases, that's not entirely inaccurate. E economists have used Eve Online as a case study for how you can how economies can work. That's how in depth it is. And the staff keeps economists on staff for to work out to make the game work the way it does. Just like to make sure that, just to make sure that the bullshit they're selling actually makes sense and isn't just straight up bullshit. Exactly. It's crazy. But that is only one. I have a, We have a couple examples of gamers behaving badly. Uh, does anybody else have anything you want to say about this shithead before we go on, though? According to uh, Polygon, um, this particular politician... And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was trying to, like, I was curious, like, oh, where is he? Like, where where is he from? Oh, it's a U.S. politician, of course. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oh, and a Republican. Okay. Um, so, apparently, during that investigation, um, it was found that the company eventually retracted its accusations and issued a formal apology. Did they? They okay. did. Um, well, I will backtrack then, because... The articles I, I looked, at, I read two articles about this going into this, had not updated that. Then, yeah, this was uh, an update as of the end of last April, April 29th. Uh, okay, well, they, they retracted their accusations and issued a formal apology, and uh, this politician um, issued his resignation from Eve. Okay, so there you go. Okay. I have questions if he resigned, if maybe this was him paying off, not destroy his reputation. Maybe. The mystery but, continues. But I, I will not make that accusation. Um, 
to move on uh, to possibly the biggest gamer in the world. We all know the things PewDiePie has said and done. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't bring him up, but... Uh, yeah. He's not the main one I'm going to bring up, but I, I have to at least touch on him yeah, a little. We, yeah. have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge the shithead's existence, fine. Oh, we, we, ha we have to acknowledge him dropping the N-word in the middle of videos and getting a lot of kickback and how people people and how people invoke his name when they're you know doing mass murder you know yep that, that's where i was going there well then, he, here's the here's the thing about that and i i will say this he he has said and i believe him that he was horrified that his name was said in that and i i believe that but I also think he has to take a long, hard look at what he's done with his fans and the kind of people he has brought and gone, Is I should have expected something like this. Yeah, and makes the, changes. He, he creates a culture where the people that are acting out and doing these things feel comfortable doing them because he, you know, allows it. Like, yeah. not directly. I mean, like you said, he probably is horrified that that happened, but you... Exactly. It, he, he doesn't... You, he, yeah, sorry. You can't just, like, you can't just do what he does and think that everybody that's watching you is, like, you know, just flowers and roses and everything's great, positive. Like, no, nah, dude. Or they're sane and aware that whatever he's saying should not be taken... should be taken with very heavy grain of salt. Mm. Yeah. Like... It, when a lot of a lot of people will say things, assuming that they're assuming that people understand what they're saying, or they may say things that they assume other people are going to understand what they mean, or that they're not to be taken literally. But you want to know what? There's a whole segment of the populace going to take you literally, and it is your fault if you are not aware of your fan base. And even if you aren't, after something like this happens. Maybe it's time to take a really hard look at what you say and what actions you do and the culture that you are building around that. Aren't you supposed to learn this shit in like grade school that your actions have consequences? Like yes. what you say and what you do can lead to consequences. Apparently but, he never got that memo. But then again, he's been in YouTube since he was in grade school. That's another. That's another scary thought in and of itself. That I know. Now where we have <laughs> that's a, this grade school. Congratulations. That was a joke. That he started very young. Congratulations. He started, the, it's the Truman Show, but real. He started very young, like a lot of these people who are having issues on YouTube, where I would say they had not been properly socialized in society. They they hadn't had to work for years with the public or with other people. And because of that, they they don't have some of these. They don't understand some of the social cues. And some of it, I really do think, is just if you became famous at eighteen, how much of the wider world do you understand? How much of people do you understand? How much of how your fans react to you would you really understand? None. Yeah. And that's what's scary. Well, this is gone, Spencer. I was going to say the scarier part is that someone as established as Cootie Pie or anyone who has that kind of a size and depth of a viewer base is going to self-justify not changing their ways because of the fact that they're going to be, oh, well, then I'm going to lose so many viewers that have come here expecting this, you know, they think image that they put up while, you know, it's more of a reflection than an image. Well, and that's doing the scariest part because... Even with something as horrifying as what happened um, in New Zealand, like he he probably will still kind of like he'll he'll taper off for a bit, you know, like tone it back for a little bit. But like once like something else happens and like the attention goes away from him, he'll just go back to what used to be working. And I mean, making the right moral and ethical decision sometimes means making personal sacrifices, and if that means losing some of the fans. That appeal that that uh, appeal to this culture that you've built and won't stay around when you changed it are those really fans you wanted to have? To be? But that shithead 
uh, is only a piece. I have a much bigger one that hits a lot closer to home. But before I go to that, does anyone have anything they want to say about the biggest shithead on YouTube? No. No? I'm, I'm going, go ahead and move on. I don't, I, I don't I, think us... The, the less time you spend on a giant shithead, the better. Also, he's not <laughs> the biggest shithead on YouTube. I would argue that's Logan and Jake Paul. <laughs> dead bodies. That's that. That's a competition that I don't think anybody wants to actually judge. Whoever wins, we lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but those two are not gamers, so they're not something I'm going to talk about here. But just in case anyone here has not actually heard about these people, do not look them up. Just trust me, you don't want to know who they are. Okay. Finally, and this is the one that hit close to home for me, because I have been a fan for years. So has my wife. The I have a feeling I, that I, have a feeling I know where you're going. <laughs> the controversy that went on with Pro Jared. Was that the one you expected? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of assumed that was what what the main focus of this topic was going to be when you started it. But yeah, go on. This, this, this is going to be pretty bad, Brian. Just, yeah, well, this th this, on. this one is actually new to me, so this is going to be a, a bit of an education since I do. Would not... you? Well, Brian, I will set the stage for you. Okay. Pro Jared, and and the first couple minutes of this will just be me explaining for you and for the people who don't know. I will do the TLDR version. Now. Yes, please. You've only got 13 minutes. <laughs> That's fine. Pro Jared made a public statement saying that he and his wife, who is another public figure, Heidi, uh, were getting divorced. That it was he. He thanked the fans for keeping it private, for for letting them have their time, and that they they were leaving the term. To which she made the response. Uh, I can't see what he's saying because he's blocked me. But you all have told me enough. Uh, no. He, he, we are getting divorced because he cheated on me with another relatively well-known public figure. Uh, and uh, he's been, as it came out later on that day, he had been propositioning his fans for sexual photos, including some that were underage. Oh, joy. <laughs> now, pro Jared, for me, is somebody I have followed for many years. He's part of Normal Boots, which is a... Uh, group of people on YouTube that a lot of people know. Um, Gerard, the completionist, is part of that. Um, for a long time, John Tron was part of that. He recently left. But uh, Peanut Butter Gamer, it, it, it's, a, it's a relatively decent chunk. It, pretty much everybody who follows YouTube on gaming knows at least one of them. So, this, this continued to come out as uh, Heidi got access to his old phone and she just started posting images of all of it. So none of this is hearsay. And then the fans would start, started posting images of his conversations with them, very sexually explicit ones, uh, with photos of both himself and others in the nude. Oh boy. <laughs> oh yeah. Holy shit. Uh, he has been pulled off of normal boots. They have taken all of the videos he had down. He has he did stuff with the Game Grumps. Everything he did on there was privatized. Uh, both of those groups heard about this before it became public. They were doing investigations on him uh, looking into his, uh, him in uh, propositioning underage people. Uh, so all these were pulled down before the controversy happened. But... Yeah, he he. Uh, when this first broke, I was watching as he was losing literally ten thousand subscribers in one minute. As what, that continued to go down, what was his his num? How big of a base did he have? How many subscribers did you? One point three million. He had literally just a uh, one point zero three million. He had literally just hit. A million subscribers, I believe, earlier that month. Well, after being in this game for I think thirteen years, like he is an old timer. I feel like I should slip the uh, the Price is Right fail horn sound effect. Right <laughs> yep, so, well, one of the one of the most. Now, before I go any farther, because there is a little more to this, but 
I will say one of the most epic moments personally for me to all of this. I have very mixed feelings about this. But one of the more epic moments was when his Reddit immediately turned against him. And then one of the people went, I hope you guys do realize that he is a moderator here. And pretty much everything we're talking about is going to be immediately removed. And then the creator of the Reddit popped in and made him and said, not anymore, he isn't. They deleted him off his own Reddit. And it has stood as a testament to all of this stuff in a place where they had been compiling all this information. Because most of this was going through Twitter. And as we all know, Twitter is not best exactly the best place to archive stuff. So pretty much everything has been screen capped and put over on his Reddit. So what you're telling me is that we might have the first actual instance of Reddit doing something good. <laughs> There's a couple instances of it, but yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so that was the first half of this controversy. Oh, there's more. <laughs> yeah, this gets way better. Oh, this gets way better. <laughs> by, be- yeah, by, be- by better, we mean worse. But... Yeah, by, by better, we mean well, factually worse. I-, I say better as someone who only came across him through a, uh, a D&D stream called Dice Camera Action, which that's, that's, that's hilariously that's... enough, one of the other people on that stream is the woman that he cheated on his wife with. Yep. The, and the, that's, 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 a, that's how I know him. So yep. no, knowing knowing nothing about him before watching two of the episodes, I thought that he and her were having a yep. relationship. I thought they were dating. I didn't realize yep. that he was married to somebody so else. I was like was, completely assuming that they were together. For Bri- for Brian and for the listeners, that was Commander Holly. Um, yes. She is re- relatively well known. Um, she was dating Ross from the game. She was dating. She was married to Ross from the Game Grumps for many years. It is currently speculated that they, they may have broken up because he found out about what was going on between her and Pro Jared. Because the information we have from Heidi was this happened pretty much a month after they bro- they were divorced. So, but that that is purely speculation. We don't have anything on that. But we do have. The information that later came out. Now, Pro Jared has only made one public statement about any of this. That's not necessarily because he is guilty or not guilty. That's probably because he has several lawyers telling him to not say a goddamn thing. Because no matter what he says, it's going to be bad. But Holly decide- made a public statement. Holly made a public statement with a lot of. Uh, of her own screenshots and facts and stuff taken, showing that unlike what Heidi said, her and Jared were actually in an open marriage and she'd encouraged him to pursue a relationship with Holly and that she had been very controlling and abusive across the course of all of this. As you can see, this this drama just keeps keeps unfolding, and there's whole layers to this afterwards. But I'm going to ignore, honestly, and I, I mainly did this because if I bring it up, I have to bring up the rest of it. I'm going to ignore the relationship stuff here. They were in an open marriage. There was cheating involved. There was not communication involved. Whatever the case, that is between the three of them. That's right now the internet talking about that is just eavesdropping on a personal matter. To me, the ultimate issue that's really problematic for the public is Pro Jared using his uh, his power as a celebrity to get nude photos from his fans and abuse his fan base, whether or not he knew they were underage at the time, which is the question. Even if he didn't. This was still a significant breach of trust. What do people think? I've dropped I mean, a lot I, of knowledge here. I, I I feel like very similar to you. Like at first, when when it first happened, and I was like at work, just like checking Twitter on my breaks and laughing because it was all the the relationship part and. That's like, I don't care about that stuff. I mean, like, obviously, if you cheat on your wife, you're a horrible person. Or, you know, if your wife, if you're, you cheat on your husband, whatever. And like the open relationship part of that didn't come out to like 
Um, well, like weeks after, like it, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't an immediate response from Hollywood. It was like, it was like, it was like a week and a half. Yeah. 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 So at, at first, all you heard was that, you know, just Heidi's end of it where, you know, they were cheating and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, at that point I didn't really care. I mean, I was just kind of like, you know, Michael Jackson popcorn meme, like just, <laughs> just enjoying the silliness. I'm but just then, here like, to enjoy watching this. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, just support, just so American celebrity drama, basically. And, and keep, and, and keep in mind this, this is for the fans, at least for me, I've been cheated on before. I definitely think is a serious matter. It's just, I don't feel that it is a matter that is that is something we sh as the public should be dealing Agreed. with. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, like you, you, like I've never I've never been one to think that because you're a celebrity that means that like your entire personal life is like public information. Mm. Um, I feel like you know you should still have some stuff that you don't have to like have everybody know. Mm. Um, but yeah, once once the once the nude image. Uh, debacle started unfolding that's when i was like oh this is actual something serious that needs to be looked into and not just like i was gonna say depending upon the age of when these photos were taken someone that is straight up illegal and oh no and you it is get... it is absolutely straight up illegal uh the when the the person who made the accusations sent the photos to both the game that sent the photos and all the emails to the game grumps and to normal boots both of which uh, basically d had to delete all the image and forward the information to the authorities because they went, it is, a, it, we understand it as evidence, but it is illegal for us to even have this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the part where it gets cringe city. I'm, I'm of the belief looking and notice I'm, I'm not posting all the images or anything else or any of the information. But I'll say, from somebody who's followed this and read pretty much all of the information they put out on this, because I was following it rather closely, because I was a I was a huge fan of Pro Jared. I love the guy. I love the work he did. And you know, there's that feeling of betrayal when something like this happened. I, I will say, from following everything, all of the evidence to me points that he did not know they were underage at the time, which does at least kind of change. Uh, the perspective on this it is still illegal he's still probably going to get nailed for this because it's already been sent to the authorities but there is like there there's a big difference between uh knowingly dealing with child with with underage pornography and not which leads itself into just never doing anything like what he's doing because of the fact that you know you, you can't know. Yeah. So you're better off not doing it than to do it and just like cross your fingers and hope that, you know, you're not going to get, you know, this to happen to you. And also you there know. also you have the imbalance of power there. I mean, yeah, when you, no, just... yeah, when, when you're a when you're a celebrity of any sort and I know I know people roll their eyes when you call a YouTuber a celebrity. But when you have over a million people who follow your content, you're a celebrity. It when you make it, let, me, let me put it this way: if you make your livelihood off of the entertain, off of entertaining other people in some fashion, you are a celebrity. Period. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, there's obviously layers. You know, like someone that's a YouTube celebrity isn't someone equivalent to being like you know one of the Avengers Conquer. or something. You know, yeah, but, but like. But it, it also depends on the groups you go in, such as I am far more likely to know who a YouTuber is than an actor because I don't watch movies. And even the movies I do watch, my wife makes a joke of the fact that I don't know any actor's name. Like, at all. So, it's it's a thing. Like, it depends on where, on what your thing. Like, we're, we're people in video games. We know who Hideo Kojima is. He is a celebrity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my grandfa my grandmother would know who Hideo Kojima is. <laughs> he makes those very strange games. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, it was the man, and he was having a miscarriage. That um, one boy, he always needs to go to the bathroom. I don't understand. <laughs> so, 
but the the uh, the imbalance of power, where even if you do everything right, you if you are propositioning a fan in any way, like they feel like a lot of them feel like they have to. They they want to be close to you. They want to do things to make you happy because there's that imbalance of power because of their admiration for you, because of their enjoyment. There is a very there is a, a, a there is a strong imbalance here, and it means that I don't think any time you do this kind of thing with with fans can be considered ethical. I mean, I'm going to talk about the legality here. I'm not even going to talk about whether they were underage or not. Just propositioning your fans on the internet for nudes, I don't think can be considered ethical. I don't think that's a controversial state. No, that's, <laughs> I think we can all be very much in agreement there. And just the things I learn when I don't follow the internet. <laughs> Listen, the internet's a very dark and dangerous place. It, there, are many, there are many evils hold, held within these walls here. It's, the internet is dark and full of terrors. I, I will say it is it is ne I, I will say just from this situation if you ever see someone from YouTube trending number one on Twitter it's probably not for a good <laughs> no probably not so <laughs> but I just want I, I want to add one thing that's like kind of on topic but not about this subject since you brought it up um mm -hmm. Because of this, there's a lot of fallout. Now, Pro Jared is known. Um, he he does a lot of Let's Plays and stuff. And, like, he's very verbally... Uh, uh, he talks a lot about Chrono Trigger and how yep. important that game is to him. And I, I've seen a lot of reaction posts. People saying that, like, they can't enjoy the game as much now that because of the connection that they have oh. with him and Chrono Trigger. And I just, like, I want to put out a general basis. Like, if you are someone who enjoys... Let's players or people who play games casually and you have connections to games through that kind of medium, like through a streamer versus playing them yourself. Try not to do that because it's 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 a disservice to the game and as well the developers. If you are connecting yourself to these people's works through someone just playing the game, it, it's like, hard. It's, some, it's something I was going to touch on. And I know we, we need to be ending soon, Brian, but it's hard because psychologists have shown that the when we de when we react to someone on the internet, when we watch someone, especially someone who speaks to us conversationally, like you have on tw uh, like you have on Twitch or you see on some YouTube videos, our brains wire themselves like we would when we are making a friend, and it's it's biological it's not something we we can, it's something we can try to stop but we have to consciously think of that because our brains go oh well this is somebody you spend 90 percent of your time with that must be a friend of yours it doesn't your brain doesn't understand that it's not an actual person that you're that you're responding to no i to i i totally understand it's i i just like it's something that like uh the, the specificness of a being Chrono Trigger is dr what drew my attention to it. Oh, yeah. But, like, just in general, like, I I, I personally don't watch a lot less Let's Players. That's not really what I what I watch on Twitch. That, that's not my interest. But, like, I understand that there's a large amount of people that that's, like, their main their main point of viewing is, like, to watch people play games that the, either they, they don't have the time to play themselves or they can't play because of whatever, you know, whatever reasons they can't play the game, they watch someone else play it so that they can still experience it without having to actually sit down and put the time in to play it themselves. So I get that. But, but wow, man, it's just, it's it's tough to see people just be like, oh, I don't like this game anymore. And it's like, oh, it's my, wow. Like, it's one of my favorite, it's one of my three favorite games of all time. So trust me, I, I get it too. Uh, the, lo the last thing I'll bring up and then we'll be all, then I'm, I'm willing to secede the floor to the end, to the half. Uh, break music. Yes, because you, you have blown past the 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, in my in my defense, I did have I did have other people talking during this as well because this was a, a topic that was. I will let you I fi think, uh, finish up. That's okay. Fine. Um, all I wanted to bring up was how 
the despite the fact that these actions for us we can go these people are problems we need to cut them off we need to not pay attention to them to the wider public when this is what's twen- trending on twitter when pro jared and this controversy gets mentioned in passing on fucking cnn which happens that is what Pete, the wider world thinks of the gaming community. This reflects yep. on gamers as a whole. And it's why we need to be better about self policing. We need, I mean, Gamergate was the biggest thing in this matter. And we're not going to go into that because we don't have time. We'll be here all fucking day. But. This kind of stuff happens on a regular enough basis that the gaming community really needs to sit down and have a good, hard look at themselves. And go, we need to hold people accountable. Now, I don't mean have a mob mentality. I don't mean, like, as we saw, more information came out about the pro Jared situation. But... When we have hard evidence like we had of him propositioning fans, when we have PewDiePie on freaking camera saying racial slurs, like we, when we have this kind of stuff, we need to take a stand and go, hey, I loved your content. Loved. Past tense. I can't watch you. I can't watch you do this stuff anymore while you do this because what your bad behavior reflects on me and reflects on all of the people around us who love video game and aren't pieces of shit mic drop i'm done ryan and there he goes he rides off into the sunset (laughs) (laughs) basically all right well it's yeah, anytime I see video game stuff, especially negative stuff, hit mainstream media, I just have to wince. Like, oh god. Oh yeah. boy. So What have we done? Yeah, we've you, oh you, god, you what have we done this time? You you, you blew it up. I feel like Charlton Heston at the end of the Planet of the Apes. You know, if, you it you blew it up. Damn you all the hell. I feel like that. So yeah. Wow, uh, dude, spoiler alert. <laughs> for, for a 40, 49, 50-year-old movie? <laughs> I think the statute of limitations has expired for Planet of the Apes. I'm just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is going to wrap it up for the first half of our first free play episode of 2019. When we come back, we've got Spencer and Ron on the other side, so... Uh, Ooh. You'll have some music and to, to wash the bad taste of disgusting gamers out of your mouth. So, you are listening to free play number one of this season, downloadable content. We'll be back.
Welcome back to downloadable content. Here, our first food prey episode of 2019. We're all still here. Um, uh, I think Spencer and Ronnie have eaten all the popcorn now. Um, now that we've had the uh, the discussion of of gamers being assholes, so uh, there's no more popcorn. You ate it all. You ate it all in your uh, fascination with the train wreck. <laughs> so, sorry guys. There's just uh, movie theaters everywhere are now going to go bankrupt. They have become <laughs> popcorn. <laughs> so, I'll I'll keep my mouth shut. So hopefully we can get through the second half. <laughs> Don't be proud that you can't keep. <laughs> Zing. Taking all bets. Yeah. That's a place your bets, place your bets. Um, all right. Speaking of speaking of betting, here's this thing that's happening in esports. <laughs> here's this thing that Ron is going to open with to start off our second half. And so, Ron, I will give you the floor. Have fun. This is the yearly, monthly, whatever you want to call it, esports segment of <laughs> downloadable content. So if you don't want to listen to this, go ahead and just like skip the next like 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to be talking about two things, mainly. One is uh, the International, which is Dota 2's um, big tournament of the year, and the the growing prize pool for it. And second will be the apparent fact that there's apparently another bubble forming in the esports uh, economic sphere. Go on. <laughs> right, so, for those unaware, every year, Valve, who is the ones who host the servers for and makes Dota 2, they do a tournament for the game. And it's usually held in August and September. And every team uh, competes for it to get into the, into the event and then tries to win the thing or at least get top three. Partly being that every year, the the tournament starts and there's always like a base like four million prize pool or something like that. There's a, 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 sorry, it starts every, base prize pool is one point six million every year, but you have the, this odd thing you can buy in game called the battle pass, and with the battle pass it gets you a bunch of free skins and uh, or not to say free, but you can get a bunch of skin unlocks, some like voiceover commands, uh, chat wheel features, things to customize the map to how to look how you want it to look all our such things and the initial pr price for it is ten dollars and then if you want to try and unlock more skins you can either play through the game normally and unlock it through playing it or spend more money and get a whole bunch of points added to your battle pass to unlock stuff faster sounds easy you good and all that stuff and whatever you whatever you buy of the battle pass Every 25% of every battle pass goes into the, the overall prize pool of the tournament. Which means, in theory, with a large enough fan base, the $1.6 million total can become much higher. Case in point, uh, let's see if I can find the exact number. Here we go. The exact number for the for last year's international, they had what started off at 1.6 million ended as as pretty much ended the day the tournament began at 25 million dollars for the overall prize pool. Yeah, 25.5. <laughs> yeah. Which meant the winning team got uh a million dollars per player guaranteed. I think I think it might be close to 2 million per player. I think I think first place was just under 10 million. Um, and it pretty much ended up being that and if I think top three top three teams were were made millionaires no matter what because of the prize pools got to that big. And th that's a lot of money for any individual person much less a 17 year old kid or a 25 year old who has been playing Dota 2 for literally their entire half their life and just that's a lot of money it is but i mean that's not necessarily much different than let's say an 18 or 19 year old who 
you know, makes it big in movies or something. I mean, yeah. how old was the kid who plays Spider-Man now? 20? When he started? For which one, Tobey Maguire or Tom? No, Holland? no, no. The current, the current one, Tom Holland. I think Tom was 18 when he when he started uh, when he did Civil War. But I, I, I can look, but I don't know off the top of my head. I'm looking, was, it, I'm looking it up now. He was definitely a teenager when he did Civil War. Okay. Which would have been his first um, Major foray. Thing, yeah. 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 His Obviously, his first movie was later than that, but his yeah, first so, appearance. So. Yeah, he's currently 23. So, yeah. Ron, so. just for clarification, uh, for last year's International, the first place team uh, won... Uh, almost eleven point two million dollars. Yeah, second I place. Really good second place was just about over four million, and third place was about two point seven million. Yeah. So that's still a lot of money. Oh yeah. Um. So here's here's the kicker. I said twenty five percent goes into the, of of what you do for the ballot pass goes into the prize pool. Where do you think the remaining seventy five percent goes? To the not to the venue, but to the people running it. Yeah, which is Valve. Yeah, yeah. Which means which means that twenty five million, that twenty five point five million, Valve just made seventy five million. Gabe, New- just kid, Gabe Newell just never kid. needs to make another game again. <laughs> and and it's it's just always a funny thing that people go, oh, I can buy a battle pass and make sure that the that the players get paid well. It's like yeah, that's not necessarily what's happening here. It's more so you're paying for the for for Dota two servers to continue running, for the Dota Pro circuit to continue existing, and you're paying for Gabe Newell's new car, robot car. Yeah, true. Um, you're never getting Half Life Three. It, yeah, yeah, and not, and not Half Life Three. Definitely not Half Life Three. Um, but it's it's just always funny, and people always said, well. What do we what do they do with the money to which Valve just gives you the shrugging emoji and they're like you, you don't know we're not gonna tell you. I was um, gonna say pe- pe- people need to accept that we're never gonna see Half Life Three because let's be honest here, Valve isn't a video game company anymore. They haven't been for quite some they're time. They're a video game provider. Yeah. Um, they are not. They are. They are not a. Pro- they do not produce games anymore. They are. They are Amazon for video games. Yeah. Not that um, well. I mean, Amazon is Amazon for video games, but you you get the reference. And this leads into the to the other the other half of the thing. Um, there's all this money going into the esports scene and to the players and the the the, the revenue of the tournaments and the, the prize pools and things like that. And you have teams being valued in some cases of up to three hundred million dollars. As the value of the team as itself, but what does it mean to actually have that denomination of money assigned to your team? Like, do you actually think a a, 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 a esports team in um, Overwatch or League of Legends or in Dota Two is is worth three hundred million dollars? Is that how much they are, is there? Is that what their brand name is worth? Is that what their um do you think that a a football player is worth that? Individually, no. Like I I don't particularly believe that anybody who pay like I think the pay that we have for both sports and celebrities and movies and stuff is so ridiculous that I feel like it is an insult to the rest of society. But I don't necessarily think that the pay we're giving esports is any different than any of the rest of those. Like, I, I don't think it's any. I don't think it's any worse than the football or baseball stars that get paid that much. The, the difference here is compared to traditional sports, where you have the, the ecosystem built up around traditional sports has a thing that's been grown had its growing pains in the early early 20th century and then grew into its thing in like the 40s and the 50s and the 60s then you had corporate money being thrown in there during the 70s and the 80s with sponsorships and things like that yeah. and now it's become this multi-billion dollar thing comparatively speaking esports tried to do that once failed 
and now they're doing it again and right now people aren't entirely certain if it's if it's going to not fail again oh absolutely well the thing that's tough about esports with if you're comparing it to normal sports is like normal sports the game's going to be pretty much the same no matter what time period you're viewing it from you know there's obviously rules adjustments and stuff like that but like it's the same game it's still football or baseball or basketball or whatever but with esports because it's like you know whatever games are popular and going at the time you know like it, it, it it's it, it's always fluid it's always moving so it's harder to tie stuff down and have it be like established that's like this is how we're going to do it this way because you know the that game might be evolved out of the scene and then the next thing you know it's a different game with a different team structure and then the payout has to be different and then so you're, you're right but there, I mean, there, there are, are more hurdles to get to where you want to be versus something as uh similar as a normal sport there, there there are transferable skills though like just because the game switch from year to year if you if you are one of the top people at playing a first person shooter you're probably going to have a lot of transferable skills into the sh first person shooter that comes out next year. The problem here is when you start talking about games that you you would assume will have a, 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 sh a much shorter lifespan than a normal traditional sports sports game. As an example, football versus League of Legends. Football's been around since literally the 1920s. It's it's almost 100 years old oh, at this I, point. I, I heard a door um it actually is. It's the 100-year anniversary. I, 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 I think... Conversely, oh, okay. League of Legends has been around for okay. eight years? Nine years now? Since the like the closed beta? And they've done a lot of improvements and updates and innovations and changing the balancing of the game and things like that. But eventually, based on how current video game trends are, people are going to stop playing League of Legends for one reason or another eventually as things stand there's eventually going to someone's going to eventually stop one people are going to stop playing league of legends as their mechanics get too old or they just don't have the time to play the game anymore and without sustained growth in that game or that 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 the next the next generation basically of players you're not gonna that this game's going to eventually fade away it's going to eventually die the servers are going to shut off yes but i i mean for for uh, for let's say a professional gamer, I don't think of somebody as a League of Legends gamer. I don't think of somebody as a professional. Like I think of them as he, that is a that is a professional MOBA player. That is a professional FPS player. Yes. The genre is what they're playing. If the game changes, as long as the genre doesn't die, which who knows, maybe MOBAs will die, but I doubt FPSs or fighting games are going to. Yeah. Like as as long like those that's what I mean by transferable skills. Like yeah, fair enough. That's that's very true, but still in the same sense. Like even even in the genre, you might not be as skilled at something. Like you know, say for example, you were really good at PUBG, and then Fortnite came out, and you're not because Fortnite, while is in the same battle royale uh, genre, it is wildly different and has yeah. very different mechanics and, and while the shooting that. right exactly so you might you may still while you'll still be really good at the shooting and like looting aspects of the game if you don't learn if you if you, building, if, you're not gonna, yeah you're then gonna you're not gonna, exactly so like it it's it's tough because like you know again if you're going back to it's it's so hard to go go away from comparing it to a normal sport um like it your your skills will always be useful as long as you have them in a traditional sport. I, but I suppose that what I'll say it, about this is that we yes, we should compare to a regular sport. We absolutely should. But there's a whole generation that's growing up, and I've met a lot of them that have no interest in traditional sports. This I mean, I mean, is going to take off at some point even if the current climate and the way they're doing it fails, uh, eSports is not going away, even I'm if not saying the current structure away. for it does. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's going away. I'm, I'm not saying, saying you are. I'm just... Uh, that's part of where the conversation's going. That's why I yeah, clarify. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because 
Kurosaku did an article recently as of recording this article is 12 days old if my math is right um, talking about there's all this money going into esports from, from investors and venture capitalists and companies and all mm -hmm. that stuff but there's not nearly as much there's not even a half of that coming out of esports in terms yeah of they're like, getting crap from in, in terms sports. of like ad revenue or return on investments or any sort of thing like that so uh, well that's, that's, that's like that's well, who's who's the, their, who's their target audience i mean you have a, you have a traditional sport which appeals to a big giant swath of the population i mean look how popular football is for example i mean the super bowl you get 137 million people watching it i mean I feel that part of that goes back to the fact that video games are culturally not as significant in this country they, the way they are in other places. I honestly would argue that I, I believe video games are actually more culturally relevant to the average American than any sport is, but we have not built up esports in any way, and plus, the other side of it is there is a huge swath of people who game who have no interest in watching another person game. It's the reason that lot that uh, Twitch is not for everyone. Because there are so, a lot of people who go, I want to play that game. I don't want to watch someone play that game. So to be fair, so in for, for most advertising, to my knowledge, the quote unquote prime demographic you're aiming for in terms of people who have disposable income and are going to want to buy your product are males with the, within the age of group of 18 to 34. And Absolutely. by and large the vast majority of Twitch's viewer base is male between 18 and 34. Okay, the vast majority of Twitch's user base is under that age, but yes. yes, of the of the of the user of the user base they can advertise to. It's yes, correct. Yes, that's correct. And so the thought is, okay, we already have this platform that someone else is already doing the work for, in in terms of like running it and putting it out there, and we already have prime viewing spaces for the the the, the juicy demographic that we're looking for. So the theory would be that whatever ads we put on there, we're just gonna like they're gonna be idiots and just buy it up immediately. Uh, and that's not happening. So well, it, it would help if they weren't to, if various places weren't taking their esports competitions and embedding them on Reddit's main page to get fake views. And that's the other part of this article that talks about it. Um, during the Magic the Gathering Mythic Championship that you were at, Brian, for PAX East that was also being streamed on Twitch. Yep. And the normal viewing of that is about 20,000 on an average based on their prior viewings, right? Which is, which is, which is, which is high for a Magic stream, but it's what is expected based on prior, what they did previously for the Pro Tour and things like that. During said streams, that viewing number of twenty thousand suddenly jumped to eighty thousand. And people are trying. People are trying to figure out, well, why did it jump to eighty thousand? Why did it jump? To, like, how did it get so high so quickly? And like, what what happened? Turns out that um, a curse, a company that does a bunch of like embedding videos into like ad yeah, like. You know how on, on Twitter sometimes you'll see like MLB be embedded on, on the sidebar or NFL during like video games or during during games. I will trust you that that's a thing. Yeah, no, the, you, the it's like an ad of a stream basically. It plays yeah. like a small amount of the I stream. I probably blocked it out of my mind. Yeah, or or yeah. ad block did it for you. Yeah, or ad block <laughs> did it for you. Yeah, but the thing, but the thing is, is that. That same that, that 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 same embedding of the video got turned on, and all those all those ads provide unique individual views. So that that number of eighty thousand is almost 
almost three quarters of it is going to be due to having the stream be embedded into an ad section and it playing in the background while you're just stro- strolling through uh, like a Wikipedia article about a, a diff- an entirely different game or you're reading an article on Polygon or Kotaku or you're you're reading through you're reading your, through Twitter feed and it's just like on the side of the screen it's just like trailing down beside you you got this video with it on mute being played of the Magic Magic the Gathering Championship. When when I heard about this, it was way before that championship. So this has happened multiple times. They've oh yeah, no, the service have been doing like this that. for like the past year almost. They've done yeah. it for they've done it for League of Legends. They've done it for Dota. They've done it for Magic. They've done it for Smash. They've done it for a lot of the esports game. But it's pumping those numbers up when those numbers are not real. Those are not actual viewers. Those are not people you're advertising to. Yeah. Um, and people, and, pe- and there was a report last year that people, that there get more people watching the League of Legends championship than there was people watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> mm, not, not really. No, no, yeah. not really. Yeah, yeah, first no. Off, no. <laughs> yeah, first, yeah, first off, over half those viewers are from China. And Chinese <laughs> viewers, and if you and if you think if you think reporting metrics in North America are bad, China is even worse. And that's, I'm not saying League of Legends isn't popular in China. Yes, it is popular. It is wildly popular in China. But do you, but it's still a, a, a fact of like those numbers are not accurate. Secondly, that same embedding thing we talked about for Magic that definitely happened during the League of Legends championship. Like uh, World's Championship, so those numbers were inflated too. I think the article eventually says what number they think actually was ended up watching, like like live viewers were they I mean, watching. It's still going to be a huge number because League of Legends, basically the number one esport slash game played across the freaking world at this point. All right, here we go. So, um, the, 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 qu- quoting the article here. Let's look at this commonly cited fact. Last, le- last year's League of Legends World Championship drew in more viewers than the Super Bowl. According to one publication, 200 million people watched the LCS last year from China alone. Meanwhile, 103 million people watched the Super Bowl. And it jumps down. Um, and it jumps down. A league publisher, Riot Games, later published the real numbers. 99.6 million unique viewers. So, that's that's less than half the, the, than the initial v- reported viewing. That's still more than the Super Bowl. Super Bowl had 113 million. Oh, okay. I, I misheard you then. And, that, and then, and, and, then, then and that all number was pretty close. And that number was lower because so many people are sick of watching the Patriots get in the Super Bowl. But I won't get into that. Yeah, and that's and that lower than average thing just because of the Patriots. Sure. But so I don't follow sports. So that's well, technically not, my home team, but I don't care. Not to go on a giant tangent, but. Also, LA uh, is not particularly known for caring much about their sports teams, unless it's the basketball team. So that also lowered that number as yeah. well. So okay, but still, like, let's put it this way: you guys have said that football's had a hundred years to make itself, and then in a couple of years, the real numbers they had for League of Legends are almost matching it. It's also partially due to the fact that a, 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 an unusual thing happened in League of Legends where the finals were not dominated by a Korea team. So you had... Mm-hmm. Chi- oh, also, the, the, uh, it was also the fact that Ch- China had a, had a team in the finals, which is the first time that had ever happened in, in a long time. So that's that's why. And yes, I know, I'm, I'm almost out of time. But the article is, just, is talking about basically that some of these numbers are, are definitely inflated... Um, and part of the reason why they're flooding this is because the hope is if the numbers appear large enough, it might draw in some of the non-gaming people to start looking at the thing and watching the ads and getting the ad revenue back and things like that and getting people to start buying your products. The problem here is the products you are selling are not targeted for that audience. The things you are selling are most for, are or gaming mice, or gaming key, or gaming keyboard, or gaming PCs, or a graphics card, or something like that. You're not trying to sell a Mercedes Benz to someone. Although it's funny that that um, certain Dota 2 tournaments are actually being hosted by 
uh, Mercedes Benz, and the MVP of that tournament gets a Mercedes Benz. In the the MVP of that final gets a gets a Mercedes Benz. Oh goody! Well, I, they 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 have all of this. That they they're trying to make themselves the same as baseball or football without having earned that spot yet. And I get that they're trying to fake stuff to do that. I would argue the fighting game community has earned that more because they grew naturally to what yeah. they are now. If anything, yeah, if anything, the fighting game size is probably the, is probably the most accurate esports sizing the metric that you would want to see. And even those numbers are going to be inflated sometimes during, especially during EVO. Like, EVO is probably going to be really crazy this year in terms of numbers, and some of that's going to be due to this video feed being embedded into your Twitch browsers or your, your Twitter feed or whatever. Um, Unless you have Adblock. Just, yeah, yeah. But pretty much, I'm just going to add on with, like, there's a lot of money going in, not a ton coming out. Where is it all going? That's kind of people are worried that to Valve into Valve's pockets, it, their deep yeah, pockets. Exactly. Yes, but it, it is a concern that people have, and it is a legitimate one for businesses and investors because we already had an e we already had an esports bubble pop earlier in the twenty first century. Having a second one occur would be pretty bad. Yeah. For the for the, for the overall health of the of the scene. Well, video games in general are pretty resilient. I mean, how many times does the industry crash just to be reborn through the ashes? So it's it, I, even if that bad worst case scenario happens, I wouldn't say all is lost in the esports e scene. You know, you might just have to be a little bit more patient about it being mainstream. Yeah, and, and, and I think I mean it's it's going to evolve. It's just a question of how clunky is its evolution going to be. So, alrighty. So we are going to move on. Last but not least, we have Spencer. So, the floor to you, sir, to close us out. So this, the, the article I'm, I'm referencing, uh, came out late April. So it's a little bit old, but I still think it's relevant. Um, it's the for those not familiar. Uh, Famitsu is a popular Japanese gaming uh, magazine, and they did a poll re uh, for the readers specifically. Uh, the article I'm referencing is saying that it's about 7,000 uh, different readers were, uh, were voting on their all-time games. In the they have the in Japan they have eras based on like their leadership on their emperors, and, yeah. and basically this last era that they had encompasses the majority of, of games uh, going all the way back to January of 89. So, it you know, not everything, but pretty much everything uh, is open to be voted upon. So I always take interest in these large-scale, best-of-all-time kind of game votes to see how not only games have uh, evolved in the social eye, but also to see what newer games uh, that have come out recently are like how they've been established in in the overall grand scheme and just to go over what the uh, some of the trends that I see on this article is just a lot of RPGs you got Chrono Trigger at number one Final Fantasy 7 at 4 10 uh, Dragon Quest 5 at 9 um, you got Earthbound you've got Suikin uh, I think uh, you got Xeno Gears, Tactics Ogre. It's just like very, not surprisingly, RPGs are very popular in Japan. So uh, a lot of these games are RPGs of some sort. You know, not all just JRPG. Uh, they're, well, that they're obviously. My, they're my people, the RPG. <laughs> uh, uh, on, honestly, one of the biggest surprises for me uh, is seeing um, like Splatoon 2. Just sitting there on uh, uh, in the on fourteenth is in the fourteenth best game according to these voters, which I I would have not expected Splatoon to have that big of a a base 
of people. No one expected it, but uh, I brought this up in a previous podcast. Splatoon 2 had reached a, uh, in one month. I, I need to look up the number again, but it broke the most games ever sold in Japan in one month. Record. That's ins- that's that's insane, and also explains so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's just it's it just goes to show that like people, it's squid splooging all over things. The force, yeah, yeah, and and like hiding in it, so it's got a like ninja stealth action kind of aspect to it as well. Um, I mean, I hate first person shooters. I do not like the games. There are a couple I've played with stories. I enjoy Splatoon. It is the first shooting game I think I can ever say that I honestly enjoyed playing. That was like me and Bioshock. Well, wait. It, well, to to not to be too technical, but isn't Splatoon a third person? A third shooter? person. Yes, it is. But yes, it, yeah, I just, believe I, I actually believe you can go into a first person mode. But okay, no, yeah, is, I was gonna say third think, person. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought I was thinking it was kind of like Metal Gear, where you have it. But like that's why I said shooter, mode. not first person shooter. Sure, fair. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, also seeing Pokemon Diamond and Pearl on the list was very surprising to me because I yeah. don't hear people really talk much about that one being their favorite. Like, I you, think you, that one was bigger in Japan than it was here. I think I've read that. Okay. Well, so, like, I mean, well keep in mind that it tied for number 20 as well. S- true, but still, like, the, the only... Yeah, I would have greatly expected like gen 3 or gen 2 to be above gen 4 in any sort of like vote like this in terms of like best games of all time because like gen 4 doesn't really introduce anything mechanically to the series that's like really lasting or influential in comparison to the other gens to make it more memorable so that's why i was thrown off by that oh, one hey look on there a tie back to what we were talking about earlier chrono trigger is number one i hope <laughs> that it's still number one after the pro jared stuff yeah that's well, that... it, 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 i'm thinking about this now what when did lucario be added into fucking pokemon was that was that Lu- diamond and pearl uh no when lucario, did is... Added in? lucario is is it gen 4 i think it is gen 4 I yeah because uh correct. Riolu is in Pokemon Go right now, so yeah. Interest introduced in Generation Four, yes. And if that, like, it, the faces of Pokemon are, are fucking Pikachu and Lucario, like those are the. the that's two. that's uh, well. I would also say that Greninja is uh, kind of the Greninja's more the recent one. Yeah, yeah he's like but... the new the new guy to the scene. But yeah, I would agree. Definitely, those two are probably two of the more popular. Greninja, uh, Greninja just dude, just because of fucking smash but that's well, that's fine well he uh, greninja was also ash's most prominent uh poke in the anime for Fair that enough. gen that was his like og guy um but yeah no uh chrono trigger i will i'm i'm never surprised by chrono trigger being number one in a list like this but i'm always happy because there's always the detractors the people who say that it's overrated and bad and i just want to people have can their have brain. their wrong opinion yeah <laughs> i just want to have their well, I just want to know like how you get to that point. Like, I, I'm blown. I'm blown away. Like, don't get me wrong. I I can accept like people saying it's not the best game, or like they have other RPGs that they think are better. But like people who actively say that the game is bad and like is one of the worst games ever is like looking looking at this list. Like, there's the only game that that like the, nothing on here surprises me. The only thing, and I need to look into it, is I have no idea what Bane Glory is. I know every it's other a, game. It's a talent MOBA, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's a very. I, I I also had to look that up as well. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very new game that's popular over there. I guess that you know I I'll, also had never heard of before. It's on Steam, it Steam I, says. I, it's on. Well, it's on. It's on Steam as of like a year ago. Yeah, it's, it came, it's not... it came out. I, I just googled. It came out in 2014 on iOS, 2015 in Android, and then it came out 2018 slash 19 for Steam. It literally the full version of the game just came out like a month ago. All right, so oh, wait, reason, no, no, like reason, three months ago. 
Reading the scene blurb here, Vainglory is an award-winning free-to-play cross-platform mobile featuring incredible graphics, precision controls, and competitive gameplay parity across all platforms. It lets you party with your friends and match up with players around the world on desktop or mobile. So it's 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 literally just a mobile mobile mobile. Hey Brian, do you uh, have anything you want to say about Xenogears being number ten? <laughs> you just said people can be uh, entitled to their wrong opinions. <laughs> I just poke in the bear a that, little. That's bit, all I'm gonna bear. say about that. But again, I also, I also want to point out that on this list, like I think three quarters of it is, a, is an RPG of some kind. Yes, yeah, no, yeah. so was, that's what I was saying originally. There's, like, maybe five yeah, that mean, aren't, are, like, you got Metal Gear 3, Metal Gear Solid 3, which, you know, I love that it's on the list. It's it's, it's not an amazing. RPG, but it's story-heavy. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and uh, you know, Monster Hunter is not definitely not story-heavy. That's definitely not a story-heavy yeah. game. I'm no, actually, I'm, I'm looking at the additional information that, that you linked, that was said on the article you linked us to, because I would have loved to have seen this list broken down, you know, kind of like exit polls because of the little paragraph they have at the end of it. Like, you know, while they don't have the number of, of votes for the full list, so they don't have the breakdown of each vote, um, Chrono Trigger, it's number one, uh, happened thanks to the overwhelming support from fans in their 30s. Uh, Hi, that's, hello. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's all of us. Um, yeah, me. So... Uh, Breath of the Wild placed number two overall, but was actually the top voted title for readers in their 40s. Meanwhile, uh, Nier Automata mostly got its votes from readers in their teens and their 20s, and and was actually number one for that age group. Now, so I would now. have loved to have seen a more complete uh, detail on how the different age groups, because yeah... Chrono Trigger is an amazing game. It's one of my all-time favorites. That's that's going to be the case for a lot of people, but you know, knowing that this is entirely a Japanese list, I'm just the different tastes that we have from each major geographical area. Of, I of I was going to say it's very funny that here Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild number two. Meanwhile, if you take a look at America, like. Mario Odyssey is generally picked above Breath of the Wild, but Mario Odyssey isn't even on this list. Was, no, 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 yeah, no, there's no, not even. List, period. There's no. There's no platformer on this list. Yeah, there's like, no. Yeah, there's no flagship Nintendo title outside of Pokemon and Zelda. Uh, those are two pretty flagship. <laughs> I was gonna though. say, it, there's no flagship except for the flagships that aren't Mario. Basically, so, and, yeah, the other and Metroid. Metroid. Thing, yeah, I have opinions on Metroid, and I will reserve those for. I don't even think Metroid is a flagship anymore. Mag it, Metroid is a signature title, but I think their four flagships are Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, and Smash. And, and I'm, eh, and, we'll see what happens with Prime Four on that. And, and, I'm, and I and I'm glad to see that of the Pokemon's on this list, um, that Gen One is the. <laughs> Well, obviously, Gen highest... Wonners are an infection upon the world that will never be eradicated. <laughs> and I think it's also worth pointing out that I feel like the, the main reason why Nier Automata is so high on the list is because the children. waifu syndrome. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. The, the children. I mean, and, and like, what, like, like what Brian said, like the that's like, you know, one of the more you know popular games for younger folks just because that's like the thing nowadays with all the also the let's anime be honest, Japan queen. loves their loves their pretentious plot lines that are <laughs> too complicated for people. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> I love that okay. kind of stuff listen, too. They I also, they, Kelly, listen, but. listen. They they like pretentious plot lines that make little sense. They love pretentious plot lines that make little sense, and they have a hot girl as the main character. Absolutely, they do. I'm not. I'm not saying that the hot that the waifu syndrome is not a thing going on here. All I'm saying is. Near for them is the full package. You have <laughs> hot androids with pretentious plot lines and giant things you have to destroy. Like it's all of the things. Yeah, with with with, with giant fucking swords, no less. It. Let's put it this way. I don't disagree with you. I'm not surprised, and I have not played Near Automata yet. But from everything I've seen of it, I feel like it probably deserves to be on a top list, even if it's not number three. 
Yeah, I absolutely yes, okay. want to check I, that I, game I, out. Yeah, it deserves to be on this list. It is actually a very good game. It's just, I don't know if it deserves to be number three, per se, but I'm willing to assume that's more so due to waifu, waifu syndrome. <laughs> yeah, and I just, I'm very impressed that... Dragon Are there abused Quest... teenagers in it? If there's abused teenagers in it, then then we hit the, bingo. The androids are abused, so yes. Okay. Dragon Quest ahead, V Brian. is an interesting choice. Now, that's a, that's a really good Dragon Quest. I would have thought something like 8 might have shown up. I was going to say, there. is that the iconic one? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, that know. really... I'm not familiar with the series. The... Dragon, Quest 5, Dragon Quest 5 has, has waifus in it. That's like, that's, <laughs> that's like Japan. No, like, literally no joke. I think it's the first waifu... That's like one of the first waifu games. Is it not? And then uh, 7 has yeah. Aerith. Yeah. Okay, look, like, yeah, like, are, we gonna, look, are we gonna do that for all of these games? Okay, so so near Tamata, Final <laughs> Fantasy Seven. Do people wife Amaterasu? I don't think so. It, she's a uh, puppy. Hopefully not. It's Japan. And you can't waifu Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. There's too many lines. There's too many polygons. Uh, obviously, um, Navi you, is you the know. waifu of Ocarina of Time. Uh, so. Clearly, absolutely. <laughs> you have Yuna from Ten. Or, or Lulu, or Riku. Uh, there, there's plenty of them in 10, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Um, again, Pokemon, no, just no. Um, Dragon Quest, it, it, Dra Brian, Dragon Quest V has the the the, 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 it, the plot line is literally, you are the hero, you get married to some people, you get married, to, you choose one or two people to get married to. Yeah, you do. Then, well, well, what makes five? I th one, Brian, uh, to talk to you about, or to, to mention, you said Dragon Quest Eight. That's more America popularity than it is Japan. Okay, yes, I'll because that's like yeah. that's like where a lot of Americans got into the series that didn't that weren't like our age and got into it with Dragon Warrior on the NES. That's right. I have to remember that because this is a Japan only. Uh, yeah. So yeah. like, go. Sorry. Go ahead. So. <laughs> Dragon Quest Eight. Well, I mean, yeah, because that was my introduction to the franchise. Was Eight, so um, that that was the one that for me sticks out in my head more so than Five. But Dragon Quest has had the long, noble history of games not quite releasing here until way after the fact. Same with Final Fantasy. But so, can you go on this list? There are female characters in Xenogears. I don't know if any of them are waifuable. I've not played the game long enough to know if that's actually a thing. Um, Vainglory is it's a MOBA, so I'm going to assume there's going to be some attractive female in the game. Um, so we get into is a lot of playable characters. Again, also probably has a waifuable thing in there. Uh, skipping Mother 2, Splatoon is squid girls splooshing all over each other. Enough said. <laughs> Uh, not Tactics Ogre, skimpy, skimpy clothing in Monster Hunter or is that definitely a thing. Uh, Kingdom Hearts is... Mm, a thing. No more of being no more of. <laughs> Snake Eater is... Snake Eater is... is um, Metal, Gear, Metal Gear Solid is just 1950s Korea with Naked Man inside. <laughs> 19, uh, are, we, are we really reducing these games down <laughs> to whether they have waifus or not? I, I, I was, was going to say, Ron just created the downloadable content waifu index for... <laughs> <laughs> 15, is, 15, 15 is the boy band, 11 is an MMO, and then Pokemon's Pokemon. So yeah, yeah, like almost half this list has, has some sort of waifu element in it, which is very disturbing. I'll say I'm kind of surprised that 11 was on the list and not 14 because i because i know 11 was huge in japan but I, I i'm surprised that the current mmo is the one on there considering well nostalgia plays a role for the rest of it i feel like nostalgia plays less of a role in mmos since you basically currently play them i, I think part of the reason why is because 11 is because 14 one when it first came out was such a bad game in japan oh you mean how it was a dumpster fire yes but compared it, to the but, but comparatively speaking when they comparatively speaking when a lot when 14 got released and it was as bad as it was in a giant dumpster fire they just everyone in japan just went back to 11 and they and, stayed and, with I, and I will say just just for the people who are listening here um i, I love 14 i i i'm 
when I say it's a dumpster fire, I say that with that the original was a dumpster fire. I say that with all the love in my heart. I am currently I I'm I took a break from fourteen to record this podcast. So please like, listen, understand. When we say it's a dumpster fire, we mean one point is a dumpster fire. Yes. Two point is, is is good. It, Two point like, and above is great. It's like Chrono Trigger Steam Edition. Like it, it, it's okay now. <laughs> it, it was horrible when it first came out. Yes, absolutely. Congratulations, uh, the one thing you, just, you just won. That. You just won the episode right there. That was this. <laughs> you, you, you. We got in our obligatory Chrono Trigger Steam reference. There you we're, go. we're all set. Um, I'm surprised at Tactics Ogre. I'm yeah, that's not a fan. series. I've never touched that series, uh, so I don't really know much about uh, the Venture? base. Please, please touch the series. Go play Marsha the Black Queen. It's amazing. Well, to be fair, right now I'm catching up on the Smash community, so since I'm very okay. behind on that. It's a, it is a very combat... It's, it's a very tactics-focused... Um, but very different than RPG. other tactics. It doesn't have, like, the waifu aspect of, like, Fire Emblem, though, right? There's only one female character you could call a waifu in it. And if you... She is a witch who experimented on people in the game, and if you forgive her and get her on your party, everyone in that section of the world hates you. And they will say, you only did that because she's cute. Because she's hot. You 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 let you forgave somebody so, so who gain. literally so, murdered so you my. So you get husband. more gain in your party. That's what you're saying. Yeah, so you can get Deneb in your party, yeah. and I do it because she's an amazing character, like power wise, and she allows you to uh, recruit monsters that you can't get anywhere else. Um, but yeah, the 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 game literally is like you're a terrible human being. If you yeah, this is why I like lists like this, because it, it exposes me to games that I would never uh, think to look at otherwise. So, the, when the, we get another Ogre Battle game? <laughs> we haven't had a new game since 99. And by new game, I mean not remake or re-release. Mm. As soon as as soon as soon Half-Life 3 comes out, they'll start working on it. Yes. Ah, uh, Okay, how about, how, can, how about Corner Trigger 2? Can we get that one a little sooner? <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's after the Tactics Ogre game. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait. My three favorite games are Chrono Trigger, Undertale, and The World Ends With You. I'm I am so sorry. A- I am <laughs> so sorry. I'm never getting a sequel to Chrono Trigger. I'm never getting a sequel to The World Ends With You. I'm just counting on Toby Fox right now. He's just praying just that... counting on Toby that, Fox. Just praying oh, that Delta Toby Rune Fox is... Your a- only hope? <laughs> Delta Rune, you are my only hope. Basically... The, the, Press F to pay respects. They, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest shock for me on this list is Breath of the Wild at number two. Just considering, I mean, I know how popular it is, but just how long it's been out. It's only been out s- since as long as a Switch, which is at this point two years. So, well, yeah, but that and Mario Odyssey were basically instant classics. Like, you don't need the test of time to know if those games are going to stack up in the future. Like you just don't, because I mean, because this is a this is a list that spans the past thirty years. I'm just, I mean, I'm not not de- denying its prominence. I mean, I really love Breath of the Wild. It's an amazing, amazing yeah, game. Point out fact: the oldest game on here, I think, is Dragon Quest Five or Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. Uh, I think no, Pokemon definitely, Red, Blue. yeah, Red, Blue would be because Dragon Quest Five is an SNES game. Yeah, but Pokemon came out in 1993. Pokemon? I thought that was 98 or 96. Oh, uh, the the US version came out a couple of years after the Japanese version because yeah, so they wanted to they, t- po- they tied it in with the anime Dragon release. No, po- Pokemon Pokemon was 96. Dragon yeah. Quest 5 was 1992. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. 5 was like I think 5 was the first SNES Dragon Quest if I remember correctly. Then yeah, four, it was that no, I I will say I'm oh, actually four, okay. really really uh happy at the distribution of games because we have games from pretty much every period in gaming history on except for the nes i think yeah the only thing well, it, it is the, NES, but the, even then you could clump in Pokemon the era Blue and Yellow, well, the was, era the era begins in 89 so that cuts out a lot of nes games yeah oh okay uh, yeah so yeah so top it's 20 it, games of the heisai era 
Yeah. So I think the only, I think the only game that might have been on here would have been Dragon Quest three then. Yeah. But I mean, we have we have a very wide range of games across all Not time. Even Dragon Quest three. Yeah, Dragon Quest V is kind of considered the 2D peak of the series in terms of like overall quality, like story, gameplay. Yeah, it was an excellent all that stuff. game. Yeah, I yes, I agree. I really enjoyed it. Um, so that's not really surprising to me. And again, like because uh, this is a Japanese only, that's probably uh, feeding more towards it as well. I personally uh, am very happy to see Ocarina of Time not in the top five. That makes me. That makes. <laughs> just makes me happy. I've Forward all of your hate mail to Spencer at <laughs> Content Yeah, please. Every search, every search. I want all the Oot fan mail hate. I want it. Give it to me. If every server of Kam is more beloved in the West than it is in the East for some reason. Compared to Breath of the Wild, which is beloved by like, like, literally everyone. The plan. This, this, is a, this is a question for you guys. Uh, I'm curious... Take a look at the list, and you don't have to list each one of them, but just how many total of these games have, have each of you guys played? I've, I've done 14 of them, counting down the list. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just curious. 10. 10? Okay. Yeah. Respectable. I, I missed the PlayStation One era pretty much completely, so a lot of the a lot of those games I missed on this. And that makes sense. And then I I haven't gotten, uh, I, I'm still kind of behind on current gaming, so the newer games I definitely missed as well. But I would probably be at ten or slightly below that if I counted only games I've beaten. But I, several of these I've played that had. I've I've beaten eleven and I played another four, so I've played fifteen of the twenty. Okay. I have uh, beaten eleven and have played twelve. Okay, so so you beat me, Ron, but I beat Brian by a little bit, and then we have Spencer. We're all we're all clumped right around fifty percent. Exactly. Let's just wait. That's still a that's still a good a good chunk of the of each of the yeah, games. The one, the and even I've... if we haven't played it, I think we all have familiarity with almost all of these games except for Bane Glory. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like the only ones I've not played are Vainglory, Sukun into Two, Tactics Ogre, Monster Hunter Portable, and the uh, what was the last? Eleven. Mine's ba my list is pretty much the same as yours, except mine add Metal Gear Solid Three. What? I, I know, Spencer. I know. Right, Brian, I'm... Brian, turn the stream off. Uh, delete Final <laughs> Fantasy from your computer and play Metal Gear Solid Three. Sp Spencer, please. I don't like Metal Gear. <laughs> oh god! I was going to be on the Metal Gear podcast, and I literally bought the game and downloaded it so I could be so I could be kind of like a a person who j literally just experienced the game as like a new a newbie to it on the podcast, sure. and I played it. And I stopped an hour in and went, Brian, I can't be on the podcast. I hate this. To which, I uh, to which I, it. to which you, ref we, I refer back to your earlier codicil of you're allowed to have your wrong opinions. So, <laughs> <laughs> rather than be on the podcast and just be like, these are all the things wrong with it, I went, I'll just sit out of this one. <laughs> that's that's fair. Although honestly, uh, three is a lot less clunky than one. Uh, oh, I mean, absolutely. obviously, I, I don't know. I don't know what uh, what drew you away from the game, but uh... Uh, oh, I, I absolutely. I assume that they've gotten better as it goes. But I am a storyline person. If I can't get through the first one, I have no interest in continuing. The storyline for Melchior is a long and complex thing. Not as bad I as King, not as bad as Kingdom Hearts. I can follow oh, the Kingdom yeah, Hearts yeah. story. I think I could handle the Metagular Solid story. Keep in mind, I'm an anime fan. I grew up on Evangelion reading on forums in the 90s to find the hidden information that was only in Japanese games uh, uh, to piece the story together. That's Japanese games and handed out at the at the, uh, the Evangelion live movies. Well, to be fair... Three is a prequel. You really don't need to know anything about the series to play three. Three was my introduction to the series, um, and I got by just fine. Yeah. 
but yeah, no, I, I, I don't really, I don't really do that with games though. Like I, I always start at the beginning. I have to. It's, it's, it's a thing for me. Well, then you should play Metal Gear One first. Then not Metal I have. Gear Solid 1. I owned it. <laughs> I play. I own the Metal Gear on the NES. <laughs> oh, I, not the NES one. The the MSX one. Uh, the, yes, the infamous. I feel asleep. So. Well, I didn't have an MSX, so I'm sorry. If I did, I would be too busy playing High Glide. All righty. All right. We ha I have to, unfortunately, end the shenanigans. So, you know, I know. So sad. So, if you out there on the wide world of the internet have any questions, comments, thoughts on this episode or any other episode of downloadable content, you can let us know on our website, dlcpodcast.com. Click the feedback button. Let us have it or praise us. Either or. Um, you can also give us suggestions for future episodes. We're always looking for fan suggestions to, to talk about. Um, also on the website, you can look at upcoming recordings. Let us know if you want to be in on one. And, of course, every single episode can not only be found there, but also on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. So, it's all there for you. So, all it remains for me to do is to thank Ron, Ronnie, and Spencer for being on this free play episode. There will probably be two more, as is the usual, for each year for downloadable content. So, on that fun note, I'm Brian. Have a good one, everybody! Mm -hmm.